Good evening, folks. Nice to have you here. Let's see who's hanging out. I've seen a couple of faces I haven't seen in a while already. So, another... Wow, there's some chemming right there. Another T viewer, maybe? Asus, Darius, DL Cooper, Infinisil, Pondpimp, our Primus, Tycholine. Oh, we've got a chatbot back in again. Excellent. And vid. And my phone's telling me that I am probably live. Or someone's emailing me right now. Good plan. Let's get that on flight mode. Hope the audio and video is doing okay. Let's see. Hey, amazing AV. We're in. We're in. We're back. Now, first, just to, to nerd out a sec, just completely alienate everyone else. Vid, Pondapip, good to have you back, guys. It's been a while, but it is really nice to see you. And you have picked the wrong episode to return because we are not pushing any pixels today. Um, okay, so yes, plan for today. Plan for today was messing around with type system stuff. Um, this is partly... Okay, so like earlier in the week, I was trying to think of what to do. And there are a few effects that are kind of like... There's plenty of effects I have obviously never tried. Uh, but nothing was really jumping out and like making me want to do stuff and so I, I put it off and put it off hoping that I would come up with something else other than just working on something less visual um, because it's nice to have some concrete task to do um, but that didn't happen so kind of last second I was like oh fuck we're doing a stream on um, type macros or something like this so we're going to be playing around with some type system stuff today it might work might not this is very much an experimental episode um, so we don't really know what's gonna happen, but that's fine. Um, but yes, if you're here for anything Tailspire related, we're not doing that today. If you're here for the pixels, afraid not. Um, what I want to get to is I want to get back to when we're doing a load of SIMD stuff again. We were able to show that we could do some SIMD stuff with SBCL, which is cute, um, and very, very useful. But we don't really have anything that needs that right now. So if we're going to play with it, we need to play with it in the context of something interesting. Um, and so I, I've got this kind of project I've been wanting to do, been mentioning on here, plenty of time is doing a kind of data processing, big flat tables kind of uh, language where we use a compiler to take these kind of queries and break them into lots of parts and run them in parallel and do all this kind of stuff. There's some, there's some fun things we can be doing there. And I want to cross compile everything to SIMD code, but because I want this to be portable across implementations, it needs to be able to compile, compile to regular Lisp as well, like standards compliant Lisp, uh, along with the CFFI. That's going to be a requirement. So standard plus CFFI, that should be enough to express everything. Um, that has some implications on how far we can go with some of these types, but we'll, we'll kind of get to that. So to be able to do interesting stuff, we're going to need um, a little language to describe. That's going to be our little DSL language. Um, I wanted to do that statically typed, so we have enough information about memory layout to do lots of cool things which we we need to have some kind of precise information about memory layout for our SIMD stuff, of course, and just for being able to talk about the performance stuff in any um, any meaningful way. Um, and for that language, we're going to need a type system. And for that type system, we need to make some decisions and experiment with some stuff. So let's do some of that. Um, so yes, type macros. Um, what I want to do here, this is really like lifted straight out of um, the very little I've looked at Idris. I've watched a few of the videos. Um, who's who's the guy that is everywhere? Edwin Brady. Yeah, I think he's the guy that came up with Idris, isn't he? Um, I've got his book here, which I, I got last week and I'm, I'm so ready to read, but I haven't had time. But I've watched a few talks with him. In fact, let's go find one of those talks because um, they tend to be quite good. So Edwin, Brady, um, Idris, uh, well there's an Idris 2 talk which is super cool, highly recommended. Um, type dri driven, driven development in Idris is the book I've got. Let's just see where this takes us. Um, there was one where he was doing like a series? Have a look here. Yes, I think this might have been it. Um, he was at a university. Yes, here we go. Dependent types in the Idris programming language. Let's get some links into the chat and let's pause that in case it's just playing sounds at you all. Um, yeah, I really like his talks because he manages to pick 
fairly meaningful examples that aren't just um, like proof theorem stuff, because right? that's not something I can wrap my head around. I, I prefer like examples a little more mechanical. Um, and so some of his stuff, at least, was I found reasonable to kind of start getting some ideas into my head. And one of the core things is obviously types of, types of first class. So types are objects, you can pass them around, just like we say in functional stuff, that functions are objects and we pass them around. Uh, functions are values, types of values. And it means you can have a function that returns a type and you can use that as a type. So if I'm defining some function, um, I'll just make up some syntax here because we don't really have anything yet. Um, define whatever, def so define func and foo, and we have some type x of unknown and some type y of, um, let's see. Anyway, I can just say test um, of, of x and one. This can be a function. And all that function would have to do, just a regular old function that returns a type. And then that is a valid thing to put in this place. And it can parameterize on other um, types as well, I believe. Like kind of, again, yeah, I've seen so little of this stuff. But if they're types, um, sorry, if they're, if they're functions that are computing types, we're going to be doing that at compile time because we're statically typing stuff. And to me, if it's a function running at compile time, um, then we are dealing with macros. So that's where I'm started. Hey, Moderay, good to see you, man. Um, I have some bits left, yeah. Love Like Syntax is here. Holy shit, guys. Everyone's back. Oh, it's great to see you. Um... And again, on the episode with no pixels. You tweet it wrong. So that is roughly what we want to do. Um, and I've been slowly developing a library, very, very slowly, uh, called Checkmate. And the idea with that, how's the best way to show this? Let's just show it being used. The idea with that is you can define a type system. Again, this is just a macro. And you're providing a load of hooks. Um, it, What it does is it defines a code walker so it's going to walk your AST and compute types on it. But there's a lot of things we don't want to take control of. One of the things we don't want to take control of is how you store types and how you resolve names to types. So um, what you can do, what I've got here right now are just a bunch of hash tables. So one for user types, one for parameter types, which we'll get to, one for constraints, which we'll also get to, and top level functions. Um, and these ones are separate, but I'll get to them a little later as well. Um, and then I've got a function that's taking a, a type spec and is just storing it in that hash table. And then when someone wants to, let's see, get type spec, um, then we take the designator and what are we doing with that right now? Um, Yes, we ensure that that designator is a list. We take the first thing out of it, which is going to be the name. So if it was int, then it's just going to be int. Um, if it's foobar, then it's going to map to foo and things like that. Um, that's what that would do is grab that principal name is this first bit here. And then we just look up with a hash table and pull back that value. So the uh, checkmate is going to walk the code and do the fancy stuff. But it's going to call out to our, uh, to us to provide it with types and all kinds of other things. So when you come down here and define a type system, we're going to give it a name. Um, and then we're going to define a couple of things. This is um, if we find an atom in the... Oh, yeah, by the way, this, this um, API is going to change violently. It's changed massively in the last two days. Um, that is going to continue. Um, so, yeah. Um, where are we? Yes, um, when it's walking that AST to type check it um, and it hits an atom of any kind, it's going to call this function in order to infer what it is. Uh, if we can, we can go up here and just see, let's have a look. Um, the, at the moment, all we do is we go, hey, is it a symbol? If it's a symbol and it's um, nil or t, so that's our true and false, um, then we return um, this expression in this form, we say truly the, all of the res results from infer have to be in the form truly the, a type object, 
and then the expression. So here we go, we're just going to go and look up the boolean type in the type system that was passed in, and um, yeah, that's it. We're going to place that as the second, as the thing right after truly the. Truly the is, um, is so in regular list we have the integer 1, for example. And that's just saying that this expression um, has this type. Truly the is something I saw in um, SBCL, and what it means is, trust me, this is definitely this type. And it forces the compiler not to look any further, not to try and prove that it's correct, just to accept it, meaning it's super dangerous, and you don't use it in your code. So it's not like a cast or anything like this. It's just, believe me, this is definitely the correct representation, and it's very easy to get that wrong. But I liked it as a way of telling the code walker, um, don't walk down this branch anymore. This, is, this has already been solved. It's already in the correct form. Um, hey, Princess of Apple, welcome to the stream. Um, and DL Cooper as well, first time. So we got two first timers. Hey, that's really cool. Um, so if it's not uh, the literals nil or t, um, then we assume it's a variable. Infer variable is defined by checkmate. So basically, they call out to us and we just call back and say, hey, it's a variable, go, go find it. Um, and otherwise we call infer literal, which is here, which we just do some checks uh, to see, like right now we just assume it's an integer of some kind. And that's it. Yeah, that's all we're doing. So this is, this is pretty janky, but it's enough to get some basics running. Um, we should be able to do something like, if I do something really simple, infer, right now I need a context, so I really should make the public API of this function not require that. Um, in fact, yeah, let's do that. Let's do, instead of context, it'll be context or, um, what's it gonna be? Yeah, let's just call it type system, I guess. Context or type system. And we'll, we'll actually say it's a type system designator. So let's go, uh, let's context is going to be if um, symbol p, so if, if this is a symbol, then we're gonna assume it's the uh, name of a type system. Um, actually, I'm gonna change it again. Let's do type case, e type case, so we can throw an error. We're going to do a type case on context type system. If it's a symbol, um, then we're going to treat it as a name and we're going to go and get the type system. So find type system um, with this name. Um, this is getting a little long, so let's just rebind this quickly as name. Okay, so there will be our type system. Um, and then we need to make a context out of it. So make check context like that. That'll do. Um, and ATNW Games, hello. Vid is saying, have you read the little typer? It's been sitting on my shelf for some time now. It's been sitting on my desk for like a week. Um, yes, I, I, it's kind of, both of these are right here and every day it's just like super tantalizing, but I've got to make games. That's a really good problem to have. I, I shouldn't even put an even vaguely complaining tone on that. Um, so yes, symbol, um, if it's already a type system, that's the right type, isn't it? Yeah, there we go. If it's type system, then we go and make check context uh, with name because it's the, it's the thing. Um, so. Yeah, I've really changed this to be like context designator is probably what I should say. And then we can define context designator load. The concept of a designator is very common in common lists. It's where you have one of a few types that re represent something. So a symbol and a string are both string designators. Um, and yes, you'll find that in a bunch of places actually. I think package designators can be package objects or a symbol that names a package. And lastly, this will be a, con a check context, I expect. Yes, there's the type. So check context, we just return as is, and then we wrap it around everything, and that should be kosher. Okay, so now, oops, save that. Um, 
Let's do infer and then pass in tables, which names our type system, and let's just pass in one and see what breaks. Okay, no known type system called tables. Well, that sucks. Uh, and we're in tables lang, so you would have thought that would work. Let's go find type system tables. So you're a liar. That's intriguing. Infer is just a function as well. There's nothing funky going on there. How bizarre. Oh, wait. No, no. It's a type of system called tables, and this is an object. All right, so I fucked up something, something in there pretty simple. Um, let's go inside. Infer. Um, let's have a look. Does make check context do this kind of stuff as well? It takes a type system designator and it sorts shit out with it. So, yeah, it calls fine type system. All right, I actually didn't need to do that. Um, we could have just passed it the name. And it'll actually freak out in this case. Okay, so I actually need to just clean this up because this is a mistake. E type case. Uh, type system designator. I'm going to say that a type system designator is a type system object or a symbol. So in the symbol case we call find type system. Um, and in the um, other case where it's already a type system object, system, um, then we call the, we just return the type system designator as is. Okay, let's see if we can get a little further. Okay, so now this type checks this expression um, and we can see that it has decided that it's um, an i8. This hash t is just temporary syntax to say that this is a type object. Um, and we'll keep on going. So ANTW Games, is Tailspire made with Common Lisp 2? Is that um, that thing on screen even Tailspire? No Tailspire related stuff tonight. This is just a plain old Lisp stream. I've been doing a couple of experiments. Um, for shaders that I'm going to port over to, to uh, Tailspire. But Tailspire is pure Unity kind of project. Um, so yeah, no common lisp in there. Um, it's, yeah, it's better for us to lean on the strengths of our team who have got decades of experience um, between them over, uh, over in Unity. So it's a better place to be, plus portability and stuff like that. Is a designator different from generic? Designator different from generics? Yes, it is. Um, well, I mean, we don't have generics in Common Lisp because it's a dynamically typed language. It's just a term that they use when you have when you have a function that can take multiple different argument types and it looks. It has this. Um, yeah, it's just a name. That's a really good question, actually. What is? Let's just have a look at string equal because I know this one. For example, you could you could pass it foo or foo and it will say true because string equals works over well, this is quite a confusing thing to look at um, but a string designator and a string designator is a designator for a string let's look at designator then a designator is an object which denotes another object in the directory entry for an operator for parameter blah 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 okay oh we've got a section on it nice Yes. So it's just formalizing the concept in various places where functions can take arguments of multiple types in this dynamic language. Um, and yeah, that's where we're going. Um, so, okay, we've got a thing that can do this checking now. And we can do st uh, simple stuff, I believe. Like if we do let a is 2, and then we say A, um, then we can see that it'll do something a bit more. This is So this will be a a, um, a type annotated AST. So it's taken the code and it said, hey, the type of the whole expression is I8. Um, the type of this expression 2 here is an I8. Um, and then we've got the progen inside, the implicit progen that's inside a let. Um, and we can see that it's A is of type ti8 and thus the whole expression is ti8 and, and sorry oh, is i8 therefore you know but that's that's the basic type checking thing 
So it can infer. Um, oh yeah, we can do this actually. Let's just do bloop, bloop, bloop. B is T. Um, then we can see that T is a boolean. So now B is a boolean, etc. And if we did this, um, we can now see the program has two forms in it. The first one is as an I8, which is A, and then the next one, which is a boolean, which is B. So again, that's just showing that this thing can walk code and annotate it with types, but it calls out to us for special things. Um, just the other day, I added the ability to define new special forms. So it will call us if it doesn't know what something is. Um, there are a few special forms that are obviously defined already. I want to hand out as much as possible. There's this weird balance to pick with these APIs. You're building a tool. Um, so you've got to do something, otherwise you're just wasting people's time. Um, so you can't be too general, but at the same time, if you take too much control from people, it's very annoying and they have to use another solution anyway. So like, not that Checkmate is really going to be used that much, but it's a nice exercise for my mind to be designing APIs to be used by other people. Um, is define type system part of a library? Yes, this is um, my Checkmate library that I'm slowly in the process of making. Um, so yeah, things like define type system is just a macro that's in that library. Um, yeah, special forms in Common Lisp are things like if and progon and lambda. These are things that have unusual evaluation rules. So the normal evaluation rule in Common Lisp is we say, hey, the first thing in a list is um, is the name of a function. This is a symbol that names a function. So we go and look up that function, and we're going to call that with each of these arguments evaluated, and any. Um, and that's how we evaluate, that's the rule for evaluating a list. Um, and then we evaluate each of the arguments, which in this case, all, they all evaluate to themselves. But then you have something like let, right? This is very different. Because here we have these two nested things. So if we followed the same rule, then we'd be looking for a function named let, which doesn't exist. And then in here, um, we would be trying to evaluate this outer form, which would mean this would be the name of a function which isn't valid, and all these kind of things. So yes, this is clearly a form which has special evaluation rules, and these are called special forms. Um, you also see a lot of um, what looks like different evaluation rules with macros, because those expand into code that then runs like normal. So um, obviously, I can't tell what special forms people want to introduce. So, my, so in Checkmate, we have as few as possible, and then we allow other people to define how those work. I can't remember what I've got in Checkmate so far, but it's here. So ignoring construct, um, we have quotes, and we have function, uh, which is how you turn a symbol into a, like, look up, yeah, how you go from a symbol to a function object. Um, you've got funcal, you've got the for defining, for annotating types. You've got truly the, which we've already seen. We've got lambda, let, and prog. And so basically it's, function calls and then anything that's going to be um, introducing bindings to the context while this is being walked and the code walker itself and things like this um so yes um big number 13 does cl code accept code like this in fact i should just copy this from here yes in this one case um what scheme would also allow you? there is there are other th what's the other ways that it's used yeah there's this there's one exact case that if you have a lambda form as the first thing in a list that is special case i, sh I probably should have brought that up so good on catching me there um but yeah that's the one place that can be done and it's kind of odd i never see that in common list code um, idiomatic common list code, even though it is part of the standard. Um, NTW Games, do you ever speak at conferences? Do you have a good voice? Thank you, sir. And <laughs> I'm fluent in bullshit. That's about it. Um, I would I, I, I'd speak at things if I have something to talk about, I suppose. Um, I, I get a lot of the kind of rambling here. So, um, I mean, yeah, there's. Um, I would like to speak at the uh, like Lisp conference more, but they have... They have certain standards that I can't keep up to, which is like um, you have to write your submission as a paper, uh, like an academic paper, and there's certain things and rules and terminologies. And I've every time I try and learn those things, I get about 
five minutes in. I think I made it ten minutes one time, and then I just start shouting and throwing things. I really can't do academic stuff. So I, um, yeah, I just don't. I, I can do lightning talks at those things, but I can't do full talks because I can't submit a, a proper request. Um, it'd be really good if that got loosened up, that requirement. But until then, I'm just going to go grumble, grumble and not do them. Um, no loss to anyone but me. So the other things that we provide here are um, the functions that the uh, Checkmate library will call when it's looking to get a specification for a type or a constraint or a parameter um, or a top level function. The reason we do these is so things like you might have interesting evaluation rules, how you map from, um, you might just look up a function by name, or you might take its type arguments into account, the type of it arguments into account. Those things will eventually get passed here, and that will allow you to provide different um, function resolution approaches. Um, see you in TW Games. Um, right. Should I mention constraints and parameters first? We are rolling on. I'm, I've been rambling for like half an hour and we haven't really done any coding yet. So I'm tempted not to just yet. There's one that's interesting though. We have this thing called type expander. Um, and this is kind of interesting. So what I want to do here is I want to be able to, um, to yeah, take a, take a type designator and expand it into a different form. And the way I do that right now like that, I have one case where I'm actually using it. Where is that? Early, yeah. Because in this language, um, the DSL language I'm making for doing the queries, I want to be able to specify bit sizes, like bit types, just by writing a, a number. So this is a one bit um, thick size thing here, and this one is seven bits. This one's twenty three bits. This defined value type is because I really want to be able to say, hey, this is what a uh, this is what a float thirty two, and this is its layout memory, um, because it, it's really trivial to do the shifts like the masks and shifts to extract this information, and because it's trivial, then the machine should be doing that. Um, so I want this to be defined like a struct because it technically is; it's just bit packed. Um, there are different in, there are different um, what do they call them in uh, f thirty two? Sorry representations um i believe oh no interchange formats was where there was multiple different versions of the things so i need to read more into this but what i'm looking at right now is hey how would i define this kind of 754 single uh, floating point number so a sign bit 8 bit exponent 23 bit fraction um is wrong <laughs> anyway yeah something like that um, and then I, uh, it's just just to describe the layout of types so you can then have the masks done for you. Um, isn't it an 8-bit exponent? Um, yes, that is. That's a very good point. Thank you. Again, all of this stuff right now is just me designing the API. It does very little. It generates a spec for the, um, for the value, and then it um, just registers it and defines a type in checkmate so I can use it as a type. Um, anyway, let's have a look. So, da, 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 da. is there anything I need to explain here? So yes, this is roughly what defining um, types and stuff would look like. Oh yeah, that was it, we were talking about this. I wanted to be able to use just straight old numbers as types. Um, so the way I was doing that was I've got this expand type designator. And when Checkmate sees a designator, the first thing it does is it calls expand on it. Um, and you return back the expanded version, and then it, it treats that as the type name from then on. So in this case, we go, hey, if the designator is an integer, then just return it in the form bits and then whatever the thing is. So this is just syntactic sugar over bits 8. So if I compile it like that, it's exactly the same. Um, but having this expand type designator thing here reminds me a lot of how macros expand. And that's where I want to hook everything in. Um, I want to have some of these books as well. Nice. Um, this reminds me of uh, Zeus's language for his relay computers. That's dope. 
Oh my god, there's so many interesting links coming up in the chat right now. I will attach them to the YouTube video so we all have those. <laughs> I'll try not to look at them just now, so I'll get totally derailed. But, there are a couple of things. So, but the first thing I want to do is I want to look up how macros are normally handled in the spec. Because they have something that you can customize for macro expansion, I think. Um, so let's just look for macro function first. So macro function will take something like, what's an example of a macro? Or, and it returns you the function object that implements that thing. So I'm just going to jump to that place in the hyperspec, if I could actually type that thing correctly. And let's go look at evaluation and see what we can find out about macros. I was just going to see if the thing I'm interested in was uh, in the C also, but it's not. Let's go up as well and look what we have. Oh, we're in um, macro, compiler macro function. Um, macro expand hook. That sounds like my, what it might be. So it's a designator for a function, which either means a function object or a symbol, if I remember correctly, um, of three arguments, a macro function, a macro form, and an environment object. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, okay, so this is, yeah, designator for function. Used as the expansion interface hook by macro expand one to control the macro expansion process. When a macro form is expanded, I don't know when you would ever customize this. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of a place that actually makes sense. But, I mean, it's there. It might be a, kind of a relic, because in Common Lisp the Language 2, the kind of precursor to the standard, um, there, were, there was more access to things like the internals of the environments and things like this. You could look up um, what type of information it had at certain points and things like this. Um, it's kind of interesting. It wouldn't have been too useful, to be honest, even if we did have that access, because most of the type stuff we're interested in will be happening after that initial expansion. But it would be a place we could put more information. I don't know. So. Let's have a look. So this is an example, which is... Okay, so essentially the default would just be like fun call. So the function that does the expanding, the form, and the environment. The net effect of the chosen initial value is just to invoke the macro function, giving the macro form and environment as its two arguments. Users or user programs can assign a variable to customize or trace the macro. So that would be actually a reasonable use for this, tracing macro expansion. Note, however, that this variable is a global resource potentially shared by multiple programs. Ick. And as such, if any two programs depend for their correctness on the settings variable, those programs might not be able to run in the same list image. Yeah. Okay. So there, for this reason, it's frequently best to combine its use for debugging situations. Okay. So that's what it was really intended for. Um, that's kind of interesting. Users put their own function in this should consider saving the previous value of the hook and calling that value from their own. Interesting. All right, so I was interested to see whether I would want to have something like this in my system. I don't think I really need it, um, but at least I can see from here what the interface is. So you have an expanding function, a form, and an environment. So what I want to do really is if I'm going to have macros, I need a way of looking up, I need to be able, a way of defining these type macros. So that's the first thing I suppose we can do. We need a way of defining them. Uh, we then obviously need to store that somewhere, that information. Um, and then we need to, what do we need to do with it otherwise? We, then we need to be able to, of course, yeah, then we need to be able to call it from here. All right, let's get cracking. So, def macro, define type macro. Um, what's going to be the argument? To this, so I suppose we need a name, and then the arguments to the to the macro we're defining will be the designator, uh, the type designator. I'm not sure if we'll pass a type designator or a type object at this point. Probably just the designator. Um, so the designator is like a lisp or a symbol or something like that that names, in this case, a type, and then that will be turned into a type object uh, by the types by the 
by checkmate. So we pass in a type designator and we'll pass in the type system object in question as well because lots of the API needs that. Um, and then the next thing we'll need is just the body of the macro. This is the thing that gets run. So then this is going to expand to, well, it's going to at least, when we compile it, return the name. So let's do this. Define type macro. Foop. Type and type system. And this, for, for now, this is just going to um, return the designator as it was. The variable foop is unbound. Oh no! Compile this, compile this. Yeah, okay, so now we get zero compile notes. That's good. So this is now expanding to just prog and foop, um, which is fine. The reason I do that is because often when you do something like default, jam, and you define a function that does nothing in this case, when you hit return, it returns the name of the, of the thing that you're defining. So that's all we're doing here. Then we're going to define a function. This is the function that's, that um, is going to be run at compile time. Um, I don't know what we're going to call it yet. Now, that's interesting actually, because if we just do name here, which we can, that's going to mean it's going to be in the namespace of functions. Um, do we want that? Do we want to be able to have um, type macros with the same name as functions? I think we do, because that sounds like we can just... I think they're different enough that we'll be able to get away with that. Is it possible to write generic math macros, kind of like def method? Um, I mean, I mean, you could. Yeah, I mean, a, a macro is just a function. So you could have it just call a method, and then you can do all the things you normally do with methods. As long as the thing's compiled before your macro is executed, then um, or expanded, then you're kind of fine. Um, Pom to pimp. Oh, you're just getting my attention, I think. Thank you. That worked. Um, we still haven't implemented the bell. Okay, so what is this function going to do? We're going to say at body, so we just splice that in. Um, and we'll just use the names provided there. So now this foop thing would expand to defund foop, taking type and type system, which are the arguments we specified here. Um, it would return type as is from this function. So it's unchanged. And then, um, yeah, then we've got that foop on the end. So let's go to the REPL. And we can see when we compile this, we get a warning that type system isn't used. Um, so I'll just do declare ignore type system right now. I don't know if that's annoying or not to have to use the type system. So what I'm tempted to do is have this macro, we just do declare um, ignorable, whatever the um, variable name we're using for type system is, and then we don't need this line and we won't get that warning. It will complain if we don't use type, but that seems reasonable because the whole point is to use type. Um, so that's just a user thing. I understand designator is just a sum type. No, it's really not a type. Um, it's it's definitely not a type because common lisp does have types, um, and you can define types and you can specify types by designate like by predicates and things like this. Um, but common lisp does have a a concept of what a type means within itself. Um, so to say designators are types wouldn't be correct if you're talking about this language. Um, but I'm using it within my own little languages that I'm making as well. So that might confuse things. <laughs> no, it was to warn me about the typo in type system. Thank you, sir. Okay. SY. Thank you. That is great. Yes. Thanks, Bondipin. We are back. <laughs> <laughs> so confused. Don't worry. Again, it, it's like it, it's because Common Lisp is a, is a dynamically typed language, so it's a different it's a different beast. It's more of a way of, like because it's really formalizing a concept um, that they're using in the documentation more than anything else. So a designator isn't a thing that's encoded in the language so much as a way of talking about some related concepts, um, kind of like jargon. 
So it's, it's a, t a technical term that they're using. But it's more like duct typing, right? So we've got a function that's taking different things and will and and it will accept different types. Um, yeah, I, I should come up with a better explanation for that. I should do a little uh, what is it? The little bits of Lisp episodes. I should do one on designators. I did one for string designator, but not designators in general. Okay, so that's the start of our macro. It's going to look something like this. Um, so now we've defined this function. Oh yeah, but I, I don't like the fact that this name is in the same namespace as functions. So I want to do something about that. So defun um, type macro name. This takes a symbol. And all we're going to do is we're going to mangle the symbol in a certain way to make it safe. So we're going to have a package. Um, where should we, oh yeah, we're doing stuff in, yeah, tables right now. Yes, yeah, 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 right. Table.macros, we don't need to use anything and we do not need to export anything. So now we've got a package. We are going to, oh, by the way, sorry if anyone stumbled in here due to the fact I put this on Twitch under basic programming. Um, Twitch is really annoying and they've taken away loads of the categories. Like, I can't put it under creative or programming because those don't seem to exist anymore. There's only basic programming, which is like, it's kind of annoying. So I've put it under there because at least it's programming related. But I'm sorry if that, that kind of confuses anyone to the purpose of these streams because they're more of a mess than something for beginners. Um, okay, so we are going to in turn a symbol that we're going to make up. So format nil. Um, and we're going to put this in the uh, tables macros package. And the way we're going to do this is... Yeah, I suppose we just concat these together with a dot. Uh, it really doesn't matter. And we're going to go... Symbol package of symbol. And then package name. And then we'll go symbol name symbol. Jesus, Chris. Come on, man. Right, so what this does is it takes a name like foo and it creates a new symbol called table.lang.foo in the tables.macros package. And the reason we're doing this name mangling is just so it's not going to collide with anything else. Um, but by doing it this way, we're guaranteeing it's not going to collide with anything else, anything already in this package. So we'll go type, type macro name. Let's angle name name. So that's going to be part of our lookup process, unfortunately, which could get expensive. So that's not great. We'll have to come up with slightly better ways of doing that. Um, actually, no. No, it should be fine. And we'll get to why. Okay, so. Um, let's have a look. Okay, so we've got a mangled name, and that's now going to be the name of our function. So if we do this... And we re-expand foop. Now we've got a function that exists in this package called tables.lang.foop. And it's the same as it was before. So we compile that and everything's fine. Um, now we're going to want to be able to look up between these names and our function that we've just defined. Um, so let's write a little function to register these functions. Define register type macro. This is all internals to this project, so the user will never see it. Um, so name and func. And all it does, it goes set f. And we're going to need a place to store this. So we're going to go registered, type macros, type macro functions, be descriptive, and make a um, hash table. Uh, the test of which is going to be EQ because we're going to be comparing symbol names so we can use EQ test for that. 
That's the pointer of quality, essentially. Um, let's have a quick look at chat. Oh man, those links are so tempting. Right, so we're going to do get hash. This is all just kind of busy work that we need to just get done. Name in registered blah 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 is fun. Okay. So then at compile time, we call register type macro with a name and. Hmm. What can we do here? Okay, so we can't actually pass the function object because it hasn't been defined yet. We can pass the the mangled name because a symbol you can. This is one of the place where uh, designators come back again. Fun call takes a function designator, so that that is either a function object or it's a um, or a symbol. So if I say print, we get the function print. So I can do fun call print passing in 10 and it prints 10. Uh, but I can also do fun call symbol. Now this is not a function, but it's a symbol that names a function. And the rules say if you pass in one of those to fun call, it'll look up the function at that point and then call that function object. There are subtle differences there. but um, So what I could do here is just register the mangled name. And that's fine. Like so, then if I come down to foop and uh, macro expand, and then go and look at registered blah 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 blah. Where is it? Um, oh, go type macro functions. We can see now it has one element in it, and that is our foop mapped to symbol, and then our mangled name. Um, but that's only going to happen when the macro expands, and that's not super useful to us. Because once the project, if the if you compile your Lisp code into a binary and then you run that binary, um, actually, how do I want to do this? Yeah, if it gets compiled into uh, its kind of binary form, like not an executable, but as as a facile is what they call them in Lisp, um, then when that loads, macros have already expanded, and therefore that thing's not necessarily going to be there. So we want to register these at execution time as well. So what I'm going to do is just down here, whoops, I've got a very good explanation for this. But basically this now expands to the definition of our function, a call to this function that's going to register the name to that function object, notes that this is a function now, and then it returns foop. Cool. So that's that bit. And now we've got to do, well, we've still got to do the expanding. Where was expand? Expand type designator up here. Um, this is turning into its own section really, isn't it? So let's go and get this. Actually, let's just do this for now. Just so I can see where the beginning and ends of this section are. All right. So then in expand type designator, I've got kind of a couple of options. Um, either it's an integer, in which case I want to return list uh, like um, bits and then the size, the number of bits. Um, or I want to go and look up our macro. So we do get hash, um, register, blah, 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 with Hmm, that's kind of interesting. So how are we going to look this up? We're going to look it up by name, but it does. But type designators could pretty much come in any form. They could be just like int, um, or they might be foo bar, or things like this. So we really need to handle them as lists. Lists. So we should get the we'll get the principal name again. So let's principal name really simple, not quite. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to use Alexandria to get ensure symbol. Oh, ensure list, sorry. Designator. Is that in that function? Yeah. So this just, whatever this is, it, 
If it's a list already, it leaves it. If it's not a list, it puts it in a list. And then we... Actually, is it worth doing that? Because if we're doing an if already, then let's just do it properly. So if it's if designator is a list, then designator. Otherwise, just the designator as it is. No. <laughs> if it's a list, get the first of the list. Otherwise, just return it as is. Okay, that's the principal name. Um, we actually don't need to do this if it's an integer. So we should delay that and put it here. Let's put a star there because we're going to do a couple of things now. Um, and then we're going to go and look up. What are we going to look up? Let's look up the macro. So let's move this here. And we're going to look up using the principal name. Oh, low resolution is fun. Okay, so now we go if macro, fun call macro passing in our designator and our type system. That's the order we have it there for some reason. So that's we'll stick with that. And then we do this. Why doesn't it like that? Reading an ignored variable type system. Okay, so I just remove this ignore up here and then we're fine. So hopefully, Um, da, 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 da. Baggers, do you prepare your code structure and function names before the streams? Do you make them up on the fly? I am very much making this up on the fly. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing, man. Um, <laughs> or all of the regulars know that this is just uh, this is just made up. Yeah. Um, bug number thirteen. Some of the the things I have been. Um, like I've done like API design on some stuff. So if I go into tables and go, da, 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 um, there's a good few documents in here. Like the project has a full like glossary based on what kind of things I'm, I've known so far. Um, I've got, again, definitions on what each part, like as far as I've thought out of some of this table processing stuff, a lot of it isn't written here yet. I've got a ton of stuff in other places that I've been uh, designing. Um, there's not much there. Yeah, so it's, yeah, this is, again, this is a super early for me to be showing any kind of project, but, you know, it's what I felt like doing and people still come and watch. Um, Uh, it's been super busy but we can pick up some more things on sketch when time is right again because uh, that's really cool project it reminded me of something and i can't remember what it is nope it's gone never mind okay so where were we we've probably written expand type designator now so it's special cases because in our dsl we want Integers, to, uh, integer, uh, yeah. type names that are integers to be treated specially. So we have that special casing, and then we have just go look up a macro and um, call it if it's there. What's kind of interesting, actually, is um, regular macros expand until they're no longer macros. That's the evaluation model for those. So we should probably do that. So then you can have a type macro expand to a type macro expand to a type macro and expand to a type, you know. Okay, so that's good. And now we really need to test this somehow. So we wrote foop down here. And I think what this is going to do instead, we're going to um, we're gonna ignore type. And what we'll do is every what, for whatever type we're given, we're just going to return um, bits one, two, uh, not one, two, three, 123. So it'll be saying whatever type it is, it's 123 bits. So now we need a way to um, to test this. If we do T type, um, currently this is the equivalent of um, the function special form. Um, whereas if you do like if you do function print, 
um, it returns the function object, the, the function with this name. Um, if you do t type, it returns the type in the specified type system. So I do tables is the type system, and uh, the designator is foop. Um, what am I sorry? I just do this. Does not like that. Okay, so we got a get hash problem in expand type designator. Um, and it seems that we have got these arguments around the wrong way. Yes, it's key then hash table. There we go. Could not identify type for designator foop. Okay, so it's calling get type spec. Um, that's kind of interesting because that means it didn't expand. So if we do this, where should we where should we go? So let's go expand type designator. Let's go print principal name. Actually, let's do this slightly differently. Print list something to just indicate that principal name and then macro. So we see that it did find foop. Like it did come, it did have that name. That is the, the expand thing is being called, but then nil was returned, which is interesting. Why is that the case? Well, let's go and have a look at register type va uh, register value. Registered value types is not what we're after. It's registered type macro functions. Actually, this whole get hash thing is a bit weird to do here, because what's common in the common list kind of thing is you have something like. Um, symbol function for looking up which is a, a function that takes a symbol and returns the thing named by that. or we have go away um, macro function which takes a macro and returns the function so we should have even type macro function name and then this get hash thing should be down there Well, hey, right, cool. So we can see what happened here because we actually left that print statement and I've forgotten about that already. It went to look up foop, it found this uh, type macro function. It called it, which returned. Oh yeah, return must have returned bits one, two, three, and then and obviously it called um, expand recursively, which got the principal name bits, which found nothing, so it didn't expand, and it returned the type object. Cool. Okay, so we have type expansion <laughs> in some form working. So is this in a shape that kind of makes sense to us? Well, it's a bit weird. <laughs> Um, I just don't like this part of the syntax too much. I mean, first off, I mean, it's a really stupid thing, but type system should come first. But then I think the rest should be the arguments from foop. Because we know, we know that the principal name is foop. Like, if we have a function definition in common list, we go defun. Um, jam x y z right it doesn't pass the name of the function as an argument it just passes the arguments when you call this with jam one two three this doesn't like this bit is all this information is already known so there's no point in passing it in so I'm thinking that yeah And do we specify the type var name? See, the way it would work in a normal macro is that you, it's not a great bit of syntax, to be honest. What you have to do is you say at environment, and then you bind that to some name. And that gives you the macro, the, the environment that the macro is expanding in. Um, but we're always gonna be passing it because 
they normally you don't deal with this at all. Where in our case, we're always going to be dealing with that type system object. So it seems weird not to have it. Let's do this. Um, let's swap these around as well, just before we go any further. So, fun call. Let's swap all that bit of stuff around. What did I break? Probably nothing so far. Um, hey, Jace, good to see you. Ooh, there's been some chatter. Let's have a look. Um, <laughs> pushing list with lisp. Yeah, well, it was kind of what we're doing today. Um, Ooh, Fit's been doing some cool projects, kind of scratch-like projects, which is awesome. But for businessy stuff, that's kind of cool. Um, what is the difference between these two things? Let's have a look. Foo and symbol function foo. Well, the first thing, this is syntactic sugar. So this actually expands to this form. Um, and I have to write it like this because this is a function. So, uh, and at runtime, it's going to go and look up the function named foo. This is a special form, which is going to evaluate that is going to be, yeah, it's going to be replaced with the, um, yeah, it's a special form. And that's why this isn't quoted, essentially. Um, let's just go here and we get some more information. Special operator. The value of function is the functional value of name in the current lexical environment. Okay. Um, but to be honest, the way I normally think about it is that it is um, it's done at compile time. Um, so you're dealing. So here you're actually naming the function directly, because um, functions are in a different namespace from from variables. So you can have let foo be one and still call a function foo and this is all legal you're not calling one you're calling the function that's named foo uh, because there are no separate namespaces so yeah this is just the this is just how you get the function named foo and this is a kind of runtime lookup that was a really bad explanation that's really annoying um oh but it made sense good let's let's go with that um, oh no, it's probably uh, because uh, Jace's description is better. Okay. Nice. Team, we got it. Right, so I would kind of like the rest of the arguments to this to be like if we pass foot one, then I want to be able to bind that to x like this. Or if I had x, y, then it would expect this. Or if I do and rest, then I can have as many as I like. That also implies I could do and key. Like I could do this, which I hadn't really intended. So I might make that illegal for now. In fact, I might make all of the at rest at things illegal and just have a specific an explicit number of arguments to a type macro. Not because it needs to be like that. But I think I'm going to start there and then we'll broaden the scope. But yeah, let's try that. So foop, just like this, will be defined here. And the problem with this then is it means these two, this is the same type as this, which feels a bit weird. The other way we could do this is we could say you define them as two separate signatures. So this is kind of a scheme signature. Um, and then you give the name for, that you want to use for the type system variable. That's not too bad. Um, in fact, I might do that. Yeah. Okay, so we'll have you define the designator. We will um, destructure this into the name and the 
args. We're going to call ensure list and designator. So now we've got the names and the name and the arguments. So this will still work, mangled name and all that stuff will work. We will then down here. To find something that where the first argument is type system and the rest of the arguments are args. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. Variable type designator is defined but never used. Yes. And I want this to be clear that that's the variable that we're using. So type system bar, type system bar. That looks good. So now if we go and expand this macro, it expands into a macro that takes the type system as the first argument and then the rest of the arguments are the ones we declare here. Um, it's still named by foop. And it's got the code we did and then it registers it. Fine, cool. So I should be able to compile that and it complains because we don't have type anymore. That's true, let's get rid of that. Um, X and Y are defined but never used, so we can just do that. All right, so that is, it's a little different syntax, but I don't mind it so far. Then if we go on to expand, then it's kind of interesting. So what do we do here? I think we're going to, Yeah, we're going to have to do a destructuring bind here of name and then arms. And then we'll do the same thing. Alexandria, ensure a list of designator. Um, and then we can get rid of this principal name stuff. Oh, yeah, it's called principal name. Principal name. And args. And it's just completing that args are never used. And that is correct. But if we go down here to Funkel. What we can do instead is change this to apply um, and then pass in args. And now hopefully, no, right, invalid number of arguments, one. Of course, yes, because we've just defined this differently down here. Where is foop? Foop is defined. Um, as something that takes two arguments. If we do this, one, two, then it expands correctly. In fact, let's you do foop of x should expand into, actually we don't do ignore anymore. So now foop of one turns into bits one, foop 120 is bits 120. Okay, so that's expanding into something, which is kind of cool. Let's go get rid of that print statement because we don't need that anymore. And what else are we going to do? I still am not stoked about the fact that, like, we can define both this and this. So I can define it with these parens here, but then I don't need the parens there. So I think what I'm going to do is say that um, you can't, that it either has to be a symbol or it has to be in parens with at least one argument. And then that at least keeps it consistent. Bug that number 13 is currently working an RPG in Scheme and a small interpreter. Nice. That's really cool. Jace is saying there's actually a couple of differences between the special operator named function and the function named symbol function, but not in the case where the argument is just a single symbol. Really? That's interesting. Because I know you can do... um. The, the only case where I remember the um, non-symbol function names are allowed is when you have things like setf. So, oh, is that? Oh, interesting. 
Oh. Okay. So you can't use um like the setf name to symbol function? That's super interesting. Yes, the argument has to be a symbol. Oh, of course, symbol function. Duh, that makes sense. Oh, thanks, man. That's really interesting. Oh, you're correct. Yes, lambda is also a... Yeah, of course, because you can do... Lambda x to x, for example. And that's legal, which expands, obviously, to function... Oh, right, yeah. Cheers, man. That's a good point. You have to use set definition to look up... Oh, right, okay. So if I go... Oops. F def. Yeah, there we go. Can't spell. Um, that's interesting. So when would you use um, symbol function over f definition? I'd forgotten about f definition. F definition. Um, no, no, no. It's not less efficient at all. That's uh, in fact it's happening earlier. This is not. As far as I understand it, this lookup. For in this case, is not happening at runtime. Um, it's handling when that special form is compiled. So you're getting the actual function there. Yeah, it's resolved entirely at compile time. Good. Starting to doubt everything now. Okay, right. So, um, what should we say? We are going to assert in our macro that when list p designator. Um, oh no, so yeah, let's just do it this way. When let's be designator assert that the length of designator is greater than one. And for now, that's just going to error, which isn't great, but it'll do. So there, that is fine. And this is fine, except for that. The fact that we haven't got um, x bound, but that's fine. Um, but this should throw an exception, saying the assertion length designator one failed. So we'll turn that into a nice error soon, um, but we don't need to right now. So that will do for that. But yeah, foo of x now um, at least expands into a. What am I doing? T type. There we go. Foo. Invalid number of arguments one, correct, because now it's something like this. Great. Cool, so that is um that's a macro kind of concepty thing. Let's see what we can actually do with that. And then we're gonna play with something completely unrelated that I'm just kind of interested in. That's uh, type related still though. Um, but not doesn't require type macros. So ah, let's have a think. Um if we Let's just see if we can do this. Infer for tables a lambda that takes x, which has some argument, and return x. Okay. So we've got a lot of unknown types here. This uh, question mark is an unknown. Um, we can generalize this function. Um, but but yeah, we're not doing that right now. So that's just saying, hey, this whole expression has the type function from unknown to unknown. And these types, the result is the same as the argument type. Result type is the same as the argument type, which makes sense because we're just returning it. Um, we could change this to Boolean. And then it's a function from Boolean to Boolean. And that's cool. Hopefully now, though, we can also go a function of foop10 and we'll see that it expands into bits 10 instead. So this is a function from bits 10 to bits 10. And that's our little function being called there. So now by doing this, we can just make shit up. So we can say i8 is the type that's always returned. Um, and we'll just 
I'm just going to use x there, even though it's completely lost. So then this is now a function from i8 to i8, because foop expanded into i8. So that's interesting. Whether this is going to be useful or not, we will see. Um, but that is what it does. A valid number of arguments too, correct. Um, groovy. Okay, so that is expanding in some way. So let's have a look. Does the CL standard include the let1 macro? No, it does not. F definition actually works with macro functions too. Exactly what it returns is unspecified. Oh, that's kind of weird. You can assign the value elsewhere. That is really odd. Oh, and then you say, no, you actually can't assign the macro value back. Yeah, that would be really surprising. Yeah, I suppose actually it makes sense that it will return because it's really just querying that namespace. But that is, yeah, that's a bit weird. Okay, so that's that. It does provide some kind of difference actually between the two, but it is a little strange. I suppose that's actually why it would work for um for setf, isn't it? Because that's a, is setf special form or is that a macro? We can look that up. Why are we even just worrying about that? setf is a macro okay yes yeah, so that's why f definition works with setf nice all right so i'm not really sure what to do next with this i mean oh one of the things we did want to be able to do is to be able to pass in something like foop of if we had ah yes here we go here's a problem Um, x is foop of y. This is an interesting situation. See, at the moment, all we're passing in is the symbol y, but it would be kind of nice to be able to pass this in, like pass this type in exactly as it is. And then you can start doing pattern matching all the types. That's that's how it probably should be for a dependently type language. Um, now we do allow some things. I'm not sure exactly where to hook this in right now. We do have some expansion. How could we do this? Actually, what happens if I do this? Oh no, it just passes in the symbol. But I am able to define functions of, like if I do z of a, whoops, x is not scoped, you're right. Let's just return z. Um, here it realized that, so that there's a couple of cases here. I can I could do, I could specify that there are two unknown type variables in this thing. So you can see here unknown seven, unknown type seven, uh, 574 and unknown type 575. These are separate types. Um, or if I do question mark and the same name, uh, we can see that they're the same type. So 576 and 576 and the whole expression obviously is 576 in the end. Um, we could do if z1, 2, and what's interesting here now is because in this position it has to be a boolean, um, it was able to work out that z is, must be a boolean. And if z is a boolean, this type has to be the same. So y must be a boolean as well. So we can see that this goes from boolean to boolean to i8. Um, if we had done a, if we have y is an unknown a and z is an unknown b, um, then we can see that when the type checker runs through, um, y is still unknown but z is known to be a boolean so here we go y unknown 578 boolean t boolean um, and then if the boolean z one of these two so that's good to see that that's working 
Um, but there's obviously some code that walks across these arguments and knows how to expand these question mark um, things out into uh, the same type, which means we could just have it walk into type expressions, type forms, like this one, and actually pass the type object itself, which would be kind of cool. Um, I'm going to go and try and find out where that lives. Um, but first, I'm just going to stage these and jump over to checkmate, I suppose, and see if we've got anything there. Yes. What have we added? Um, allow designated. Yeah, okay, right. Allow designated to infer and make check context. There we go. Cool. Um, and then let's go and find where this would be. So I'm, I'm guessing it's in check and infer. Let's start there anyway. And then let's look for infer lambda form. And yeah, then we've got quite a bit going on here. So you have the context, the args, and the body. So we're going to go and follow args and see where it leads us. Um, there's some passing of passing of declarations here. What's this? Okay, so this is probably handling some unknown stuff in here. Yes, yeah, so it goes and, yeah, it takes the argument list and flattens it. It remove, it goes, okay, so remove if not unknown designator. Cool. And then it, yeah, then it knows all the unknown variables. Then what does it do with them? Arg unknowns. I don't know yet. Oh, this is okay. So this is some stuff I haven't shown yet. Is this called any other place? Um, construct designator args internal stuff. Um, I don't know how far I can dig into this right now. I'm going to have to have a read through. Um, so there are a few concepts in um, Checkmate, which I guess I haven't really shown yet. Um, you can define a lambda. Let's see if I can remember how to do this. Um, You can add constraints to a type, which, which are just a set of predicates that the type has to satisfy. Um, and it's left ge very general like that. You just have to satisfy a pre predicate. So it gets past this type information. If it satisfies, then it's fine. Um, oh, what's the best way of showing this? I actually just removed, let me just dig into the history and find an example because I removed a bunch of stuff which would have been helpful right now. Um, bang, an impulse um, satisfies. Okay. Ah, where should we go? Uh, impl. Yeah, let's just go right down the bottom here, dump a load of stuff, and go through it. Come on, dude. Right. then we will do this over in here. So what we can do is we can say, hey, we've def we define a constraint and all it is is a call to this predicate. And this is the predicate here. 
and all it has to do is um, this thing function either returns true or false and if it's true then it satisfies if it's false it doesn't satisfy and what it does is um, this one uh, looks up have we actually got anything that um, that we can oh man I'm gonna have to go and find more examples again sorry about this really cool just to be able to show this that's why okay so when you define a type you can just define some random data that gets attached to the type specification um, so here is just like an a list with this symbol implements maps to this list and so I was thinking of using this system for like traits or something like this so let's say that this means you've implemented this thing and is disposable so to be to satisfy disposable you have to satisfy this predicate and all this predicate does is look up this custom uh, spec data and finds if this symbol um, yeah gets what is implemented and then just sees if disposable is in that list of things that are implemented so pretty bare bones um, and then you can specify that hey we have an unknown but what we do know about it is that it satisfies disposable. And so whatever solution to the type um, check is, it must satisfy disposable. So there's this stuff in here as well. I'm gonna be using that for doing traits later on. Um, now why the hell did I bring that up? Um, oh yeah, because I was gonna dive deeper into that code. 2126, is that the right thing to do? I don't think we'll di dive into that just now. Instead, we're gonna detour onto something slightly different. So let's just be okay with that for now so um, expand type designator so we can have a to do here is expand um, what is it pass type objects as arguments rather than um, Uh, just the symbols, I guess. Okay, let's go with that. What I wanted to have a look at in the remaining time, let's just actually go through the chat a little and then we'll go from there. Um, oh, somebody's just head off. I missed them. Um, Bug number 13 saying this question might be a bit off topic, but would it be possible to write VR applications with Keppel? I mean, Keppel just handles the GL side, which is one part of the thing. Um, I don't really know the rest, to be honest. Um, I thought some of the VR stuff required Vulkan. In that case, then no. Um, depends if you can, I mean, if you can use GL with VR, then you're fine. Um, that's it. Oh, Vid's heading off. Well, it's lovely to have you, man. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll see you next week or any week. Doesn't matter when you can drop by. It's always cool. Chase is saying, even more fun, it's possible for a symbol to be a special operator P and, and to have a macro function, which is then used to help code walkers deal with non-standard special forms. Oh, that's interesting too. Cool. Yeah, Vid, if you do get a chance to show it off, happy to see that here. That'd be great. Um, yeah, so I don't know the restrictions about the VR stuff. Uh, Darius is saying, in case you don't know, you can reverse chunks or even selections inside chunks with, I think, key V? Reverse chunks. How do you mean reverse? Do you mean undo? Um, or do you mean like swapping things like foo and bar and swapping them around the other way? Yeah, the, the, the uh, commit messages are all garbage. As usual, it's, again, this is a project that's not being worked on or consumed by anyone else, so I can get away with bad commits for now. Do not do this as a sign of, uh, of anything else. Oh, somebody was punning. How dare you? Get out! Please don't. Right. 
let's uh, let's let's go on to the next little thing. So the other thing I was interested with in is um, if I go to my infer if right now, this is a very simple thing. So we get we get passed a um, an if form. It's going to have a context. There's always an expansion context. It's got the test form, the then form, and the else form. So if this is if foo bar baz, then foo is the test, bar is the then, baz is the else. And right now it has to have all of them, but we'll deal with that later. Um, what we then do is we um, we check that the test. Um, is of type boolean that will unify if it's an unknown um, we then infer the type of then we infer um, oh yeah we, we infer the type of then we get the type from that um, inferred result remember that infer always returns things in a, as a list of truly the a type object and then the form so even if we have something as simple as infer one it returns it as truly the the type object and then one so what it's doing here it will take a typed expression so in this format and we'll just grab the type from it um we grab the type from it so that will be the second uh symbol in this list in this case um and then what it does so it it, it gets the type of then and then it checks that the else has the same type as the then does um, so if t one two, let's just do that. Actually, we can see that it's fine because both of these are um, an an eight bit integer. Um, but if we were to do one nil, it's going to freak out because it can't find a way to unify, which is to satisfy the type checker between boolean and i eight. Okay, so that's not ideal. Because it's a restriction that doesn't necessarily need to be the case. In a, in, a, in a language like Common Lisp, where we have prog and, and things like this, well, even, even actually in a statically typed language, it doesn't have to be this way. Because the result could be or an or type. So let's say for this one here, if, if some test 1 nil, um, it would be or i8 boolean. Right? So that might not be a useful type in, in most cases, but it is the correct type for that form. So, and what you could do then later is to, depending on what you know, and this is going to be kind of interesting, uh, but depending on what you can tell, you should be able to split this up. So if later on you had um, a type check, so if, type, if, like, if we did this, let x is um, this. And then we did if type p of x is um, boolean, then 10, then 20, right? Then we could actually correctly check this because the type of this expression is going to be or boolean i8. And then we know that yeah, both branches of this satisfy. So as long as we can um, store an or a, the result type in something, which we can in common list, we don't want, like um, don't worry about the types. Or if it was compiling down to a more restrictive language, then maybe we just box the type ourselves. Um, see about number thirteen. Um, yeah. that was yeah so basically it, it should be possible to have this be reasonably typed um and just delaying things here and the reason i'm kind of interested in this is because we're going to have this dsl language we've got macros that are going to work inside <laughs> as well not just type macros but regular macros um and so i can imagine people wanting to make um a what would it be um like a dispatch mechanism um, so what they could do is return, like have a, a switch statement with one of a few things, and then they could dispatch on the type a little further down. Maybe, but I think it should be possible to to make some kind of reasonable um, type for this. So I had some notes. I'm going to see if I can see them from here because I've got them on my whiteboard. So I'm just going to stare away from you. Um, 
Okay, yeah, we'll have to see what we can do with that. But let's uh, have a look at what is going on here. Arasus, it's, what seems a little weird is the if would return either a symbol type or an or type. That could be confusing. How's that? Because what, what I'd like to have it is if they're the same, then they return just a single type. Basically, or would collapse down into a simple type if both branches were the same. It might be weird. This, I mean, there's probably a very good reason that other languages don't do this. Um, sorry, I'm just checking out something. I'm trying to pass the information about magic that I was getting. Um, it reverses whatever you've selected. You can stage and unstage changes line-wise. Yes, I think I understand. It applies reverses what you have selected in your... Oh, interesting. Yeah, I didn't really want to reverse that as much as just get that code into this project. It, it was That was in the Checkmate repo, and I wanted it in the Tables repo. It was just a... Yeah, just I knew in the history somewhere I'd done some tests that were relevant. And maybe because it's not used to it. Oh, yeah, could be. We'll find out. I'm all new to this stuff anyway. But and it, it could be completely useless, it, but um, it's kind of an interesting one. So the first thing we would do is we come to if here. Um, ah, one of the things I'm actually need to do is... I would need slight changes. It might be a reason why I haven't done this in, in the um, off stream yet. So in... Fur will go and return the type AST. Check is very simple. All it does is it calls infer and then it unifies the types. So um, but that can have that has side effects when the one of the types is um, an unknown or a, what uh, what would they call them in um, in the type theory. Um, oh, it was like TVARs and things like this when I was looking at the implementation we had before in some of the literature. Um, man, I'm dry. So yes, what I actually need is a way to do this where it doesn't it doesn't mutate. We just want to actually see if they're different. I suppose what we can do for now is always return all types. You know, we can just, um, we'll just do this, type then, type else, we'll say infer, uh, context else, and then the type of the let is, um, <clears throat> How do we do this? Da, 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 da. Do I have a neat way of making those yet? That'd be really stupid if I don't, but it probably don't. Well, let's just try find type. Find t type or then else. Does this work? Who knows? Oops. Oh, yeah. All right. Okay, so what did we have here? Um, expand type designator nil. I'm not sure how that happened. Internal designator to type. Okay, nil came in there somewhere. Let's just bring back the rebel. Um, but it's unlikely to be this nil, because that's not a type. Construct designator args. I equals one. Okay, that's just going to be in a loop somewhere. To type. 
Oh! Oh, I'm a bug. Okay, so, yes. Those are the arguments. Types are then... Typed else. Cannot identify the type for the designator, truly the blah blah blah. That's correct, because these are typed forms, not types. So we go, then type is um, type. What was it before? <laughs> type um, of typed expression. There we go. Type then. Else type. Else. Then type. Else type. It'd be a bit weird as well because we're passing in objects. So yeah, could not identify the type for designator i8. Okay, so we don't allow just passing in those um, types like that yet. Uh, how can I hack this just for the end of the session? Um, I mean, I, c I could do type to designator, I suppose. I think I think I have a thing for that. Checkmate, um, designator. Oh no, I haven't exported that. Type designator? Do I have a function for that? Nope. Um, that seems weird, actually. I guess I don't normally convert it the other way. I obviously do something when I'm printing it, so I should have a look at that. Um, let's go into checkmate and core and grip for def method print object. Oh yeah, designator from type. There's a the thing. So is that exported? No. So checkmate. That's an internal symbol, but it will get us through the day. So if we do type and we say um, tables um, 10. Fuck you. The value of type is that, which is not of type t-type. Ah, oh, okay, yeah. So that is, um... Oh man, I'm really having to start screwing around with the internals of Checkmate if I'm doing this. That is gross. So what do we do? Do we do that or we end the lesson early? No. Checkmate. D ref. Yes. <laughs> D fun hack X X Right. Good grief. Hack. Okay, so we have that. <laughs> then it's gonna return an or type of i8 and boolean which is you know what we asked for which is okay um, but now what do we do with that so what I was gonna do is I was gonna make a new special form which would be type p this wouldn't be a regular function because um, it, its return type would be something to indicate that it's it it's predicated so it could either be, oh man, it's really, really annoying to describe. Like, can I do this? Eh, let's have a look. Let's have a look. Um, special form. We're just getting to that part of the lesson where I just start hacking wildly on stuff and we just see what happens. So, e case on name. Um, if it's if, then we do this. Oh, no, it's not e case, sorry. It's just case. Um, if it's type p, then we infer type p passing in the context 
passing in um, the args to first of args and just assume that this is uh, this will do for now I'm going to go defun infer type p so what I want to do is I want to return a special type that says it, it's either going to be a boolean or it's going to be this predicate type um, that has the information on oh it's really hard to explain it, it basically represents the type p as a type um, and then we can pattern match on that later so um, let's have a look um, oh no, that was just Darius talking about the repo stuff as well, which is great. Super useful. Love hearing more magic stuff always. Um, how would this work? Okay, so... Type object. Let's just do break here and who and see what type object is. And we're just going to do infer type p of oh wait there's going to be two arguments isn't there there's always going to be two arguments first and second first thing is going to be um, a thing and then there'll be a type name I guess or a designator yeah let's just do desig Thing, desert. I just want to see what we get. Type P of one and uh, let's just write boolean. This is going to be interesting. Uh, invalid number of arguments three. Okay. Yes, it has to take a context as well. Okay. Yes, we get them unexpanded, so we get one and the and um, boolean. What are we going to do with that? So actually, for the sake of argument, we're just going to say that this is legal in our um, special thing. You have to specify the type designator directly. It's not quoted and it's not evaluated at runtime. Yes, type P in this thing is going to be compile time special form thing. So you don't quote that part of the form. So we do this, we get one and Boolean, fine. What are we going to do with that? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to infer the type of thing. So let's just do infer um, context and thing um, and what are we going to do with that? I don't know, let's just stick it in some variable for a minute um, typed form um, and what will be the type? We, we can say that Oh, this is one of the places I need to be able to. Um, what I would like to do from this is I would like the type of this either to be Boolean, if we can um, prove. Yeah, I wonder if we can actually have the type be like literal true. So, but yeah, it, it would either be Boolean or some special um, type that we're going to pattern match on later. Fuck it, let's just keep going. So in the end, we're going to return uh, truly the and then some type and then the expression which was um, what is it type p thing desig um, I'm going to call this a predicate type I want to say pred type is um, oh, again we're going to have to make some kind of some kind of type here um, let's define a new type uh, define t type um, designate it is going to be pred of pred of x I think we can do let's have a look at how we define types again because I just don't know um, we're getting down to the wire Okay, so yeah, we define types like this, and then we can specify um, the, that the type arguments are actually some literal. 
Um, by default, they're just considered to be types, which is actually what I want in this case. Um, so, pred of type, do that. And then pred type is going to be find t type. We have the worst API list. Let's just do it with back quote. Pred of designator. Let's just see what happens. <laughs> um, typed form is never used, so is it not now? That really should be this. Let's try that. Let's see what this is. Okay, so we end up with a type called pred of boolean, um, and that's the result of calling type p um, on one and you passing in boolean. What am I doing? Um, then, so now we've got a type that says essentially that Really, this needs an argument. This needs to specify what might be a Boolean. Um, and that really doesn't work. Oh, fuck. So what I, let's just write down what I was actually going for, roughly. I want to be able to specify, let A be, um, How is this going to work? Sorry. Let's see if I can remember. Type P of A and Boolean. And then I wanted to be able to say if B. You know, something and something else. And A would be the result of some other conditional. It's really kind of hard to see the use case here, but okay. So in this silly example, A would be or Boolean string, and then B is going to be um, the result of this, and then we were going to use that here. So what I wanted to be able to know was when I got here, I wanted to know I wanted to have checked this type and I wanted the type of this expression to be something that we could pattern match on here to actually work out which branch was relevant. It's basically just yeah, solving this then. But basically checkmate's just not in a place where I can do that right now. Because there's too many things that I would need to be able to reference like this type really needs to be able to have um to reference the bindings, I think. I'm not entirely sure. Yep, I think I'm running into a, a kind of dead end of my thoughts here, so that is not going to work, which is kind of annoying, because that's a, always a bummer of a way to leave off a stream. Um, the good part, of course, is we got those type macros in, but that hasn't, that's not super useful in itself until we can start um, passing in types as arguments, so from the other bound names and things like this. <sighs> so that's that's a little frustrating, to be honest. Oh well. Um, okay. What can we do in the last few minutes? We have seven minutes remaining. Um, let's make another two hours to finish this now. Oh god, it's so tempting. So tempting, but um, that's not really fair on my partner. <laughs> um, I have used the or types in um, Varia, so if actually let's just bring that up. There were there were some cases it was kind of relevant there. Um, quick load Vario dot tests. Can't even spell it. And package vario tests, yeah. And then we could go and go and have a look at that. So the works vario 
uh, tests, conditionals, I suppose. Oh no, okay. Is there no conditional tests? That'll be in flow control. So, one of the things we wanted to be able to do, um, if I can just show this here, GLSL code. Yeah, is we have a lot of places where we might have if forms with different um, types out of the branches. And that's because there's a lot of side effects and stuff in GL. And so for this to type properly, we needed to have or types. So if returns or integer um, float in this case. Now you can't bind that to anything. So if you try to do um, let a of this, then try and use a or something. Hey, it's like you're trying to make a local variable a with the type or int float. Um, and goes on to explain why. But what was useful about it is because whenever you have a progon, um, you're really dealing with side effects. Um, all we had was if you didn't bind it to anything, um, or you didn't try and return it from anything, then it was cool. We didn't really care about that. We just we typed it to or type, and then we just let it go. And so in these cases, that was really useful. We do have some other cases where you are allowed to do some kind of interesting stuff. So if I let me just bring this up here. So here is an interesting one. Oops. So here we have um, another expression. This one, um, again, has different types on the branches. Um, and it does return the result that comes from this if, because the if is in the tail position. But the reason we allow this is the type of this is basically that the, the shader is terminated. And so that just kind of goes away. So the expression, the, the, the type of this ends up just being float, uh, float for. So there's a couple of places that we, we allow different things. I try and remember if there was anything else we did kind of funky and interesting with all types. Um, No, I don't think so. There was one, I, I can just remember there being some kind of interesting edge case. Let's just look down here and see um, if I can remember anything here. Vec4, Vec4, no, these all these are the same types. But whiles and cases and Actually, there's a lot of cases. Let's go and have a look at those. Yeah, no, most of these are just testing that the uh, exceptions are thrown correctly. Okay, no, so that, that was really where we were using it, was just to handle cases um, where you had ifs in non-critical, non-return areas of programs, um, or if one branch terminated. But it does seem like all we're really doing with the or types is delaying. It's it's like you're you're making the check slightly lazy. You're just going, okay, I'm not going to deal with it right now because it's probably not relevant. But let me flow this information down a bit and see if there's a place that where it's fully handled. And if it's if the program's still total, then we're fine. Um, but if it doesn't handle those branches correctly, then we're gonna, then we're going to have an issue. So I thought I had a way. I, I, when I doodled it up on the board, I thought I had a way of representing that and passing that around, but it did require um, some kind of dependent type that that gets returned when you do a type p. And clearly, I just haven't got that straight in my head yet, so we'll have to have to come back to it another day. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where we are for the evening, I think. Hey, Sergeant Queeps got back into this again the other day. So was there any more for any more in this last minute or two? And if not, I will call it an eve. And while we're doing that, I'm going to pour myself a little more coffee. Um, and yes, if you have any ideas for kind of graphical type stuff, 
that we uh, should do, we'll um, do let me know. I'm very interested in that. Um, yeah, there's just I, I really want to like I'm gonna try and keep doing this stuff in my own time. Um, it's nice to do it on the stream every now and again, but again, I I'm not sure. I, again, you guys can tell me because obviously we're, we're just whittling down the audience to the point it's people that enjoy <laughs> whatever kind of shit we're doing, but. Um, Obviously, the graphical stuff has a more immediate appeal. So let me know um, thoughts and comments and wants and wishes and things like this. And we'll see how we can do it. Um, obviously, a lot of things don't fit into two hours. And some things are kind of just variations of stuff we've done before. So, you know, but we'll find some stuff. Um, yeah, it's always a pleasure to have you, ma'am, and everyone else. It's it's really cool. It's, it's nice that people keep coming out week on week. But yeah, next week, we've got to find something a bit more graphical to do. And I'm not sure entirely what that's going to be. But there's probably some... Uh, there's lots of things we can be doing. So yeah, I know parallax mapping is one of the things I want to do uh, at some point. Because we haven't actually done that on a stream yet. Which would be quite good. Um, I, could, I could revisit that cutaway. And um, do some more things there. Uh, but yeah, I'll, um, what I'll do is I'll expand the type macro stuff. So we can actually pass in the, um, the types correctly. I'll... Uh, Start looking a bit more at Idris, and um, we'll keep going. Guillaume, sorry I didn't see you then. Good to have you. All right. Let's call this a night. Um, oh, wait a second. I'd be interested to know how one would do a free camera. Basically, a camera that could be operated like a spaceship so there is no rotation limit in any direction. Totally, we can do that. Parallax mapping sounds cool. What was the second book on your desk? There's a few books down here at the moment. So the first one is The Little Typer. And the other one is Type Driven Development in Idris. And uh, yeah, that's the lot for now. So let's just get myself organized and I will see you all next week. Peace.